here on Feminist Voices and I'm here to tell my story. I was born in December 24th of 2001 and my grandmother always tells me this thing where she's like, you were so impatient, you could have been born on Christmas, but even as a child you're always impatient. I was born to my mom, she was 22 at the time and um, she wasn't married to my dad and you know how families are when it comes to these things. Mom was a teacher, that's where my mom met my dad at college and then met me. My cousin's mother was still in South Africa at the time, so sometimes she would manage to come and bring us stuff. That's when also my mom transferred. So in 2004, they had already separated with my dad. Uh, even though people were like, stay, stay, my mom then chose to separate with him. And then 2008, she got remarried to my stepdad. My mom came to Vlad because she was pregnant and then she had my younger sister. So yeah, 2008, I then went to primary school and um, I think now that I'm trying to think about it, it was also kind of a bit of a fun time because you know, when you are in primary school, gender roles haven't really started to kick in. It's not really the boys that side, the girls that side. So it wasn't really a big thing to want to spend time with girls or to want to be with girls or to play dolls because I remember at the time we'd play like roles, you know, you're the aunt, you're the mom or... So it was really fun times because I think it really doesn't start kicking in where the boys want to be the boys and the girls want to be the girls and you know, you start feeling left out. And I think now that I'm thinking about it, it was one time. And also it was the time that my cousin left. So I was now really by myself. It really wasn't a thing of, you know, there was no one who was asserting the agenda. And I think that was really the end of it because primarily I moved to schools a lot. So when I was in grade two, um, it was at the time when my mom had gotten remarried and I had to move away from that and go and stay with my parents my grandparents in the rural areas and that's where i think that's where my first sense of boys don't do this girls don't do that girls do this boys don't do this and for me it was very strange at first because i'm like for the past for every year that i've lived i haven't really been policed according to my gender this much but when I got there, it was like, oh, boys don't cook, boys don't clean, boys go to watch over the cows, boys go to milk the cows in the morning, boys are the ones that are responsible for this. And for me, I think also, even though I didn't have the language at the time, that's where I started to experience my first sense of gender dysphoria, where you have that rude awakening to say, oh, so now I'm supposed to behave this way and it was really that gender divide that was so strong to say boys spend their time alone watching over cows milking cows farming then the girls go to fetch water they clean they and i always felt this thing of wanting to be with the girls <laughs> and always wanting to do what they were doing um i remember every time that so because my grandmother had a lot of daughters that were still at the day at the time and it was just me and her last born son who were the so-called boys. Um, I really wanted to spend much time with them, but I couldn't because it was always, every time I would be found with them, there were always questions to say, why are you here? Why are you spending time with these? You're supposed to be spending time with the boys. And I think primary school was also kind of hard in that sense of even, that's where I think I started getting bullied like in primary school where the boys were like but you don't you don't behave like us you know you don't you don't act like a boy so i think that that also at the time it wasn't like a conscious decision but i think your subconscious start to kick in where you start to negotiate safety and i think that's when i started to over excel in my schoolwork because i knew that if i was close to the teachers then they would protect me from the boys they would protect me from anyone who would want to harass me or whatever and if i told them that this was happening to me they would come to my defense so i was the teacher's pet <laughs> i was really smart so it wasn't really that hard but also i think when you do those things not because you enjoy them but you're negotiating safety it's easy to feel imposter syndrome where you feel like your achievements are not really yours but you want to impress the people around you so that they can accept you so that they can see you 
beyond your perceived flaws so also that sense of you're moving from town to the rural area so everyone has a perceived idea about you or urim saladi or this town people and whatever so it was it was kind of hard for me especially the first two years but by the time i got to grade six now i i had gotten used to it i had managed to make friends with the popular boys the so where I was in the rural area where I was staying, it's funny because the popular boy was the one who could beat everyone in class. <laughs> so now I had managed to say, so he didn't like writing notes, he didn't like like doing schoolwork. So I would do this thing where we would like trade to um, where I would write his notes and he would bring me a lunch team. And if anyone was trying to give me shit, he would then step in for me. So then now because i was associated with him now no one was giving me any trouble and my teachers loved me so because i was like I, I they even wanted to nominate me to be head boy when i was grade six which had never happened in the history of the school i was doing a lot of things i was doing choir i was doing public speaking i was literally even now i kind of still have a record in that primary school because I, I i really i wanted to take my mind off things but i also wanted to put myself out there because i felt that the more you sink under you don't have a voice you don't have a network if people abuse you you don't have someone that you can say hey this is what's happening to me but if you have a relationship with people that have power or if you have a relationship with these people it gives you visibility you can then go to them and say this is what's happening to me and they can step in so i think from a very early age i've always then started to realize power structures i've also realized how they can affect you but also how you can use them to protect yourself and yeah so this boy i think when i was in grade five we kind of had <laughs> a semi semi relationship situation <laughs> But I didn't recognize it as such. But he would then say, so if someone was trying to give me shit, like, don't touch my wife. So at the time, like, they had now gone past the point of you don't behave like a boy, and they were now like treating me like a girl. Like everyone in school was just like, that's a girl. That's that's her. Just leave her alone. She's just like one of the girls. They would play these games, dry humping. So it was just like the boys where they would dry hump you. But then they would, with me, everyone wanted to dry hump me and. That's when I started to feel like, no, now it was now moving into the realm of sexual harassment. And I remember at the time I even called my mom and I was like, I don't want to go to school anymore. And my mom was like, why? And I remember I couldn't even tell her about it because I thought that she would shame me because I had always felt like maybe it was my fault for not being masculine enough. Or they would also ask questions to say, why don't you protect yourself? because that was something that I'd been asked before by my family to say, this is what's happening to me. And they were like, why do you let other boys do that to you? You are a boy, stand up for yourself. And I think I've, I've resented her so much for that. It's, it's something that we really haven't worked on till now, but I think every time I think about it, I kind of still feel like you could have protected me. You could have opened a channel for communication for the both of us. I was being vulnerable with you, but you closed that door for me. I think that incident was also the way where I started to emotionally avoid, where I would just say, I don't deal with my emotions. I just, if something is happening in my mind, I either tend to work or tend to a book or tend to uh, something else, but not to deal with my emotions because a lot was going on at the time and I really didn't. And for my teachers before that I had relied on, with physical bullying, you can go and tell them. But at that point, I couldn't come and say, this is what the boys are doing to me because I felt embarrassed that I'd let them do that to me. And it was something that continued for the whole of like the whole year. The more the year progressed, it was now like you, you, everyone wanted to do that. Yes, Tamban was useful in a sense because he would then say, no, don't touch my wife. But then he would then go on to do the same thing. Fortunately, uh, grade seven, my mom then, my stepdad then decided to say, I want to stay with my children. And that's when my mom said, "You, I can't take care of your children once my child is not here. So if you're bringing your children, then I'm also bringing my child here. 
and then um, that's when I transferred schools and then moved into back to Bulawayo. I had my first girl crush. <laughs> Oh my gosh, she was stunning. She was she was really pretty and she was smart and she she was good with maths. It was just I, and also I think in a sense for me it was also like oh my god I want to be with her. I want to be with her, but I also want to be like her. So I, I had such a sense of awe whenever I was around her. So everyone was like oh my god. So everyone at the time was also picking on the sense that no, this one is different. But then now, because they saw my fascination with her, they were kind of confused to say, what's exactly happening with you? <laughs> you know, what's exactly happening with you? Why are you so into this girl? Because we thought you were gay. And at the time, I think that was literally the first time I heard the word gay. That was literally the first time someone called me gay and i'm like what does that mean because i remember even asking my friend and i'm like what does that mean is it like a bad word and i think my friend didn't want to tell me what was going on and they're just like no don't mind them it's, it's not big of a deal and then that's when i actually found oh this is what it means because i remember my mom was using those nokia x2 at the time and uh you would buy data and then you'd go to google and you're like what is gay? <laughs> I literally went on Google and I was like, what is gay? And I'm like, <gasps> and at the time, I was now turning into Adventism. So it was really I'm like, no, I can't be. Because even at the time, like every time I was growing up, I really didn't see myself like looking at boys and I'm like, I want to be with a boy. Or it was that thing of like, I was so locked up with what was going on to me. Even though maybe I could have been like, hmm, this one or that one, but it never really got to such a serious way. I'm saying like, I had a boy crush. I, I don't think I did. I don't really think I did. Our relationship was so confusing because at the time she would be like, do you want to be with me or do you want to be like me? And I'm like, I really don't know. I really don't know. Sometimes she would even like borrow me her clothes. And she's like, do you want to try this on? And I'm like, yeah, and then we'll do it. And she, she found it fascinating. So 2015, I went to high school and I went to Maranatha Adventist High School. I told you I found the Lord. <laughs> uh, so yeah, my mom was now into Adventism. The whole family was into Adventism. So I went to Maranatha Adventist High School. And I think for me, that transition wasn't really that hard for especially, I think the first two years because I was really um, into the whole religious, the whole religion thing. So um, it wasn't really hard for me. And I think at Manat Adventist High School, that was also at the time where um, I managed to find people that were like me in a sense of, I wasn't friends with them, I didn't talk to them, but you'd, meet, you'd see someone from another class and you're like, we're similar. <laughs> We behave the same and also some, you'd hear people talking and you're like, I want to know this person. Um, I want to get to see this person and then you see them and you would feel a sense of familiarity because finally it was not really a big institution because it was that kind of school where you had like 30, 40 people in class and everyone knew each other, the whole school. So it was, um, and it was also, so for the route that I was using, there was a lot of girls. So now I had an excuse to be walking around with girls and talking with girls and being friends with girls because I'm saying, well, I don't know anybody else here. These are the people I go home with. Who do you want me to talk to? And I think that was where I also started to have like a proper system of girlfriends without, you know, people kind of judging me or saying things about me because I had an excuse. <laughs> and that, that was really the first time I had kind of that. And I was pretty excited because it was more or less, um, it wasn't a public school, it was a, I, don't, I can't call it a private school for their standards. <laughs> I think it was a semi-private school. Um, so yeah, it was it was an exciting two years, but then I think the time that you get to form two, uh, that's when you, you know, the, 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 the puberty starts kicking in and everyone else starts dating and I think, at the time, that's really when I can say that I had my first boy crush. And <laughs> that's also the time when I started to notice, oh, boys. I think that was like, um, 
so but also because it was now conflicting i think also it characterized most of my high school it was like their highs were very high and the lows were very low because it was now the time where i was like really serious about religion but also this is what i'm feeling i think my high school was just uh, more or less of overachieving trying to please the people around you trying to avoid dealing with what is going on with you but it was also in high school where i had that aha moment where i was like okay we've run away too much this is also and i think also because i was now in high school i could interact with people that did not have the same religion that i did people that could critique my religion also to make me think they can say but no i've always accepted this maybe if this is not the way that it was done and it was also that time where i said no i'm gay <laughs> So at the time, it was the languaging that I had, it was the definition, everyone was always pointing it out and it was high school night, it was serious, everyone's like, you're gay. And I'm like, no, I'm not, everyone's like, no, you are gay. And it's also one of the things I found funny in life that people will always point it out to say you're gay if you don't want them to say it. But the moment you say, yes, I'm gay, they're like, no, don't be gay. <laughs> Currently, post high school, I think um, when I went to use it, that's when I really started to explore my identity and my sexual orientation. And I think at the time, as much as I heard about LGBT, LGBTQIA+, I hope I did not leave anybody out, um, I still thought of myself as gay because even within the queer community, the people that I had interacted with, I'd never seen anybody who's trans. And as much as I learned about transgenderism, I had no identity. Then um, 2021, I think September, uh, that's when, no, October, when I came to use it. And that's when I opened my Twitter account. And that's when I met Jordan online. And I remember that was such a light bulb moment for me. That was, that was, you know, when you know the light goes on and you're like, no, this is who I am and, and from then on and until now, I've always had so much love and respect for her and, and so I'm, I'm so grateful for what she has done for me in terms of making me realize my identity but also supporting me to explore my identity. I'm so glad that from then on, uh, I've really gone on to explore my identity and for me i i really want to say this because mine is kind of a very different story from i've always known i've always and i've had to ease into it it's one thing to know who you are and it's also another thing to then explore that because i remember the first time i would just put on lip gloss and i was like this is no is it is it showing is it different and then i i, I then started to do my nails and then I went for my nose and I would do like crop tops with like guys jeans and and I really kind of eased into it and then you really start to explore your identity the more you explore it the more you realize that this is one this is who I am this is where I'm supposed to be and this is what I'm supposed to be doing and as much as it was hard it felt right you know for the first time in my life I really was feeling that even if something was putting me in danger, it was worth exploring. For someone who had negotiated safety all their life, it was exciting, it was different, it, it didn't feel heavy. Even sometimes people would say things, you know, when you post like your pictures online and people would comment, it really didn't affect me that much. Of course, it does affect you, be lying to say it doesn't at all, but it was worth it. It was, it felt right, I was happy and I built a community. I found people like me and I remember sometimes I would attend these events and I would meet other trans people, I would meet other queer people, I would meet other non-binary people and they would tell me their stories, I would tell them my story and some of them even know me from like social media and they would tell me that I inspire them by sharing my story and it meant a lot to me that I could do something for somebody and this something for somebody is not coming from me trying to negotiate something or to negotiate for safety or to negotiate for power but it comes from a place of we're strengthening each other as a community we're being there for each other and i think for me what i've really found was through sharing my story i inspired others to share their stories 
and i think that's why i've always been intentional to share I, I don't want to share only the good things i don't only want to share um the pretty pictures i just also want to share the bad experiences so that someone who follows me or someone who thinks i'm inspiring them has a full picture of what is going on understand what really is going on mentally emotionally for safety reasons and i remember uh, i met some of my twitter mutuals at a club and i was sitting with one of my trans friends and i was like ah, i don't want to go and say hi to them because they know me um when i'm trans you know they don't see me when i'm negotiating safety in these spaces um and then uh he said to me something that i've really found profound and was like it's not about how you look it's about what you bring it's about who you are and if they understand that they will appreciate that and that was very important to me and i think i'm glad that through exploring my identity i found community i still think that a lot of my queer friends are family i'm, I'm that one person who always be right there deep in the mariana trenches defending a queer person no matter what they did <laughs> uh but i, I really I, I have so much love and respect for queer people and their resilience and their strength and no i don't have a particular chosen family but i think all my queer friends are family too. what is your relationship with your family like now i think my relationship with my family now that i've come out it's different because um most of the people that were my cheerleaders when i was overachieving uh, have chosen to kind of distance themselves away from me but I think the person that has always been there in my life maybe not really physically present but always been there my mom uh, she we have stuck together I think my mom was the one who said um, I'm going to be your mom whether you like it or not but I'm going to take care of you until you're self-sufficient but I think our relationship um, starts and it ends and where my identity starts it's a relationship that is ongoing but as long as i'm not myself to her we don't talk about it uh we just we know that it's there we know that this is who you are but we're not going to talk about it you're not going to show it here but i think more or less she's afraid of being seen by her siblings and by the community as someone who's endorsing my identity because we have talked about it and between the two of us she seems now that she has gotten to a point where she's no problem with my identity but it's been a long way to get the security of all of those other people her siblings the community around you the church that you had grown up in was that ever to you going to be worth denying your identity to yourself or to other people I don't think so. <laughs> I think, to be honest, that's where kind of my story differs in a sense because, uh, number one, I moved a lot when I was growing up. I changed schools quite a lot. And also because of my experience of not really growing up with my parents or having my siblings not growing up with them, I really didn't um, have that kind of connection to them to worry so much about them my biggest concern was probably saying that um what if i be, i destroyed this big pyramid this big castle that i built all this overachievement all these labels as an example to other children it was very self-centered it was very for selfish reasons but i really for them for me it wasn't tell us about the first time that you fell in love <laughs> I think I've already spoken a bit about it, uh, about her. That was your childhood love. That was my childhood love. I think uh, post that, I really don't think I've heard, I've fallen in love. I don't think, uh, because also because I think I was now really actively trying to explore my identity. And love is something that is secondary to me or that has been secondary to me because I want to come to somebody as who I am. I don't want to be in a relationship either way don't see me for who I am or where I don't feel like I am not myself in that relationship. So within this particular journey of um, finding myself and I think when I do feel like I'm ready, I go for the love. Your dating life, your social life. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I think my dating life has been okay. But I think it has been the same challenge. 
mostly because um, I don't feel like in a relationship I am seen as myself. I don't feel like in a relationship I am seen as myself and I don't think I'm coming in a relationship as myself and that is hindering me from exploring kind of relationships and to a certain extent I really did feel quite bad about it or think that it was something that was different but then I also watched like a lot of trans content online and I found that is actually something which is common with a lot of trans people where they felt that they, they they didn't explore much relationships until they felt that they were in a state but when it comes to sex now <coughs> uh, it, it's been booming but mostly it comes from people objectify trans people a lot so as an openly trans person especially with cisgender heterosexual men most of them do have these fantasies if i can call them that about trans people and they really do want to explore like sex, sex with trans persons but not relationship with trans persons and that's really something that i really don't want to be engaging on a lot this year or going forward because i really don't think that is worth it to be having sex with someone that doesn't see you as anything more than a sex object but that's just me and i really don't want to sound like i'm shaming other people for their sexual choices this is just a personal decision what do you identify as i identify as transgender and my sexual orientation is pansexual well some people did correct me a bit to say it's not really pansexual but it's also queer because i really don't feel like i'm attracted to cisgender people that includes cisgender heterosexual women and cisgender heterosexual men. Do you think that the social climate that we're in is something that has robbed you of finding yourself earlier, of things like love? You mentioned that you're not thinking about love because you're thinking about exploring and finding yourself so you can meet someone somewhere fully. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think it really, the social climate has robbed me and other trans people greatly because i think for me as i was saying earlier that I, I i don't really think much about dating because i want to come to a relationship as fully as i am as i also expect a fully developed human being in terms of your eq in terms of iq and i think in a different social climate it, it would have been a totally different experience because now even when i think about it maybe at some point i would also want to consider consider to transition and within this social climate it's also a question of can you afford hormones can you afford surgery um it, it, it really does affect you in a sense that um you tend to look inwards more than outwards because there's a lot that is already going in within your mind within your emotional and mental life that you don't really kind of think but then i, I also i can and I, I i want also people to be aware of this maybe in general to say that trans people experience their lives differently my experience is my experience i know trans people who are definitely flourishing who are dating and living their lives fully and finding loved ones within the same scenario i really don't want this to be every trans person's experience this is my experience and that's why i'm sharing it um but most of them and i think to be honest to answer your question transitioning does make your life easier it does make even finding sexual and romantic partners easier because if you have transitioned um you can even start dating for someone who's pansexual like me you can even start dating other women and in that relationship let it be known that it's a women woman being with another woman but if you stole for me in this case in this body it kind of makes you don't want to explore that avenue even though you're attracted to other women who want to be with other Tell women. me about your social media community i think for me the good side of social media has been the affirming side and I think I've really been affirmed on social media more than I have been affirmed in person. And I think also exploring my identity through social media kind of 
pre, uh, give me a safe medium through which I can explore my identity because on social media I can dress the way that I want, I can present myself as the person that I am. But sometimes in person it's hard to do that, especially considering issues of safety and negotiating safety. But also on social media, there's everybody on social media. Sometimes some people can also access your content and they can um, affect you mentally and emotionally by their comments or so especially when i was starting out on twitter and i think i really my my accounts my other accounts are private but my twitter account is public so when i started out on twitter and one of my pictures was kind of retweeted by a couple of people and i think in a sense i felt like i didn't have control over my content in a sense because also i didn't know how to operate that platform and it did because i had to take like two days out of social media because of the kind of hate that i was receiving through either comments through either quoted tweets but um i've really found so much love i've really found so much community i found friends and honestly i would encourage any other person who really wants to explore to find themselves where they can find themselves. There's good sides and there's bad sides. But for me, I think I'd really like to focus on the positive and how social media has really given me that medium to explore my identity and find community. I think my social life has drastically changed. <laughs> um, I think before I came out as who I am, I was more or less of a home person. I was more or less a very conserved person. I'm naturally extrovert, but I, I didn't go out. I just stayed home with my family and my sisters. But then uh, after I came out and then I found friends, um, my friend even makes this joke way to say that every time you see one queer person that you can easily identify, know that there are a whole lot of queer people within that circle. <laughs> queer people move together like a flock of birds. And I think that's very true for me. And I don't want to generalize that experience. But um, ever since I found my friends, and those are the people that I go to the club with, maybe a little bit too much. <laughs> maybe a little bit too much. Um, but those are the people that I go to the club with. Um, those are the people that I, I've also found queer friends at school and those are the people that I really spend much of my time with. Also, I think even within the social aspect, it's also exploring queer sins or spaces that are specifically curated for queer people. And I found that um, both good and bad in a sense, uh, because sometimes you find that these spaces are not really as affirming as they're supposed to, to transgender persons in particular. But um, they're very a uh, medium in which um, you can, and also if you are part of the social scene, you also find out spaces where it's safe to go and like club. So you know within the community there are those bars or clubs where someone's like, no, let's go there, it's safer there, or let's go there. So it's, 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 I've really found it fascinating. It's like you're mapping, you know, you're mapping and saying, oh yeah, we can go there, we can go there, we don't go there, we don't support this business because they're homophobic and transphobic. But yeah, it's, it's been quite interesting and exciting. Can you imagine a vastly different experience um, to be a transitioned or a passing trans woman in Samoa? I, I definitely do. And I'm sorry, I'm really about to sound political <laughs> because these are even controversial issues within the trans community itself. But I think passing does give you so much privilege over non-passing or trans women that haven't transitioned and i think there is more acceptance of your identity as someone who has transitioned as someone that who has not transitioned and even i've seen that for my friends or my sisters that have transitioned their experience is vastly different from my experience and also my their experience is also vastly different from the experience of other trans women that have either not transitioned or that are not passing. And I think even when we do look at the statistics, trans women that do not pass are more likely to either experience violence or are more likely to either be shot or be killed uh, because of presenting who they are if they cannot pass as cisgender heterosexual. So I think passing privilege is something that does exist and it's even uh, 
more beneficial in communities like Zimbabwe it's not safe to be a trans person because if you are passing then no one is assuming that you are transgender therefore the violence that is comes with your identity is not you do not experience it because you're passive. Is transitioning something that you're interested in pursuing in the future or do you feel that you feel wholly and fully affirmed in who you are and you don't you don't need to transition? It's something that I've really given a lot of thought. I think transition is something that is but I'm glad I think maybe I'm glad it's important for me to highlight this. I'm glad that we have really gone on to establish that being a transgender woman is not wanting to be a cisgender woman you are a transgender woman you've always been and you'll always be and how you explore that identity is different to each individual person some people would want to transition some people do not want to transition but i think for me personally i've come to a decision where i've decided that transitioning is something that i'm going to explore in the future and this comes from how i see myself and how i want to see myself and i'm glad that it has come to it started as a point of how i wanted the world to see me how i wanted the world to accept me but now it has moved on to a point to say really really do i want to be in this body or do you want to be in a different body i am fully affirmed of who i am i know who i am i accept myself as i am and even when I'm exploring this other part of my identity, it's affirming my transgender identity that I fully affirm and accept. And it's not saying that I'm going to be more transgender or I'm now going to be transgender just because I've transitioned. I am transgender now, but I'm transitioning because I am transgender. And it's something that I want to explore as an individual and not for anybody else. Tell us about accessing healthcare. As a trans person in Zim. Accessing healthcare as a queer person in Zim is hard. <laughs> Whether you identify in the LGBT as any other acronym within that big alphabet. Uh, I think, um, but it's even worse as a trans person because for you to access anything, mostly in Zimbabwe, especially healthcare, you have to produce identification. And in Zimbabwe, most trans people are still not allowed to change their gender markers. And for trans people who have transitioned, it's also actually hard for them to access healthcare. But for trans people who have not transitioned, it's even worse. And most trans people that transition nowadays either do it um, without the supervision of a medical professional or getting their hormones from the black market and then administering those hormones themselves. And the ones that you can get officially are very expensive and most trans people cannot afford and when i say most trans people i'm included in it <laughs> um so i think it's something that really is um kind of a big disadvantage and that puts off most people from transitioning uh for me personally it's also one of the reasons why i haven't started um my hormones because I'm thinking that one, it has to be sustainable, it has to go on. I'm now thinking long term because hormones are something that you take for life. So you need to have a steady supply of income to afford those hormones. And if you want it to be safe, if you want it to be healthy and not affect your system, you have to get it from a medical professional and that's further um, money that is needed. And yeah, currently exploring that it's very expensive and stops so many people from exploring that avenue of their identity. Tell us a little bit about why you wanted to do this, this documentary, this interview. <laughs> I think I'm going to really sound <laughs> political, but I'm a very political individual. But I think even going back um, as Africans, we really do like a lot of documentation not only of the work that we do but also of our stories and this is even worse for the queer community to such an extent that much of queer history has been erased because and much of identities have been erased or and we have now been called a new phenomenon even though that we've always been in existence 
because we do not document our stories we do not document our work we do not document our experiences and i think that's one of the reasons why i felt the need to come and do this documentary but also because um of the power of stories and i think for me it's very important that transgender stories come to the forefront because if you go to much of the work that is done in terms of advocacy for transgender person in this country it is more or less our bodies it is seen through who we have sex with through um kp programming but this is more or less concerned with numbers but not the stories of actual transgender persons and i think it's really important that we come forward we tell our stories in a way that is safe and comfortable for us to share our stories so that's why personally for me i would feel that those two reasons are the major reasons why i'm doing this